welcome to To Your Health with TGMC. I'm your host, Rhonda Alfred, and I would like to welcome Dr. Jill Sutton, pediatrician at Pediatric Care TGMC, on tonight's show. It's normal for newborn parents to worry constantly, but luckily with Dr. Sutton here, we hope she can help to ease your nerves a bit so you can enjoy bonding with your new little one. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sutton. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I was born and raised here in Houma. I went to Vanderbilt for high school and then I went to LSU in Baton Rouge for undergrad, went to LSU in New Orleans for medical school, and then um, recently finished my residency at Children's Hospital in New Orleans. That's a long time. So how many years did it take to complete your medical career? Um, four years of, after college, four years of medical school, and then three additional years of residency. Let's begin with jaundice. Can you tell us a little bit more about that condition? Jaundice is caused by a buildup of a substance called bilirubin in the baby's blood, and it can lead to a yellowish tint to the baby's skin or eyes. And before the baby's born, mom's liver kind of helps the baby to get rid of all the bilirubin. After the baby's born, the baby sometimes has a little bit of trouble getting rid of it on their own. And due to certain factors, some babies may have higher levels of that substance than others, and that's what leads to jaundice. Is it a serious condition and what should parents do? So in the hospital we do keep a very close eye on it in the newborn nursery and if it gets very high then we'll treat the babies with phototherapy which is basically just a blue light that goes on the babies and it interacts with the bilirubin that's causing the jaundice and helps them to turn it into a form that they can get rid of. And so after leaving the nursery usually um, the pediatricians will kind of follow it, can kind of keep an eye on it, either clinically by looking at the color of their skin, if it's yellow or not, or by doing labs. How long does it take to get rid of jaundice? Well, jaundice usually does increase over the first five or so days of life, so it will likely go up even after the baby has left the hospital. So, um, it, but if they do need to be put under phototherapy, then usually it's, you know, 24 hours, sometimes less than that. And the reason that we keep such a close eye on it is that if that bilirubin level gets too high, then it can cause some problems with the baby's brain. So that's why we keep a very close eye on it in the nursery and treat it if we need to. Okay, let's move on to colic. What should parents do if they suspect colic? The true definition of it is if a baby is crying at home for more than three hours a day, more than three days a week, the parents are having difficulty consoling the baby. If you suspect your baby has colic, you should really bring them to the pediatrician to get them evaluated to make sure that there isn't any other underlying issue causing their colic. Because usually with colic, it's crying that isn't due to any harmful cause. So you want to rule out any harmful cause before you just say that it's colic. Right, because when a baby cries, you know something is wrong. Right. But if they're incessantly crying. Right, and a lot of times we don't know 100% what causes colic. A lot of the time um, it can be attributable to possibly something that with their formula or something in the breast milk or something that they're getting overfed. Something intestinal is sometimes what it's contributed to, but we never really know 100%. So what is a way to to help comfort the baby. Is there a medication that you could give them or There are several over-the-counter medications that are available. Um, there isn't great evidence for them. There are gas drops, there's gripe water. There isn't great evidence um, behind any of them, but some people do think that they work. For breastfed babies, it's um, recommended for the mother to keep an eye on things in her diet. If anything in her diet is making the baby more fussy, some common things would be dairy or um, certain vegetables, caffeine. And then for formula fed babies, you can try switching the formula to a more gentle type of formula. Is there a particular cause of colic? Not that we necessarily know. It's been attributed to certain types of abdominal issues, like if the baby is getting overfed or if there's something in the formula that they're not agreeing with, like a milk protein allergy or something like that. But there isn't any specific cause that's been identified. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more from Dr. Sutton.
the TGMC Kids Fit Fair, another way we provide wellness education to our community. Terrebonne General Medical Center, a new way of health. Mark your calendar for Saturday, May 12th for the largest 5K road race and Cajun food festival in Homa. The Kids Fun starts at 5.30 p.m. and the 5K race starts at 6 p.m. The event is open to runners, joggers, walkers, and wheelchair participants of all ages and abilities. Every race participant receives a commemorative t-shirt along with entrance to the food festival and the kids' corner activities. Category 6 is on stage from 6.30 to 10 p.m. For details on how to register online, go to tfae.org. Let's move on to cradle cap. I know my firstborn had it and I didn't know what it was <laughs> on her poor little scalp. So what is that and what can parents do? Cradle cap is kind of a, a flakiness of the scalp. There can be some redness involved as well. Um, it's not harmful to the baby, but it can look very scary to the parent. So what you can do in that case is you can try washing the baby's hair a little bit more frequently, or you can also use some baby oil that you rub in the scalp and comb up the flakes using a fine tooth comb or a cradle cap brush. So these topics are bringing me back. I had the colic and the cradle cap. So what about if a little one comes down with fever? That was another common one. All of a sudden, my child is burning up. What mm -hmm. should parents do? If your baby is less than one month old and their fever is greater than or equal to 100.4, then that's considered an emergency. So I would definitely bring them straight to the emergency room if your baby is less than a month old. If they're um, one month to three months old, I would call your pediatrician. You still want to get them evaluated um, soon, as soon as possible. If they're a little bit older, then it's not really something to be quite so concerned about because usually it's going to be due to a virus. It's going to be something that's going to kind of run its course. You can um, use Motrin and Tylenol and just kind of keep an eye out for any other symptoms. When should parents worry? You should be worried if your child is again less than three months old. Definitely get them evaluated. If they are not waking up to eat anything, not wanting to drink anything, having decreased urine output, or um, just acting lethargic, then in that case, I would definitely take them in to get checked out. A lot of kids experience ear infections. Is it true that they are one of the top causes for pediatric visits? It is. So there are a lot of ear infections <laughs> that happen in kids. Some kids are more likely to get them than others. It's usually pretty easily treatable with a short course of antibiotics. What does the baby behave like? If you suspect that your child has an ear infection, things that might clue you into that would be fever, um, then pulling at their ears. If they're younger babies, then signs might be fussiness when they're not usually fussy, not sleeping as well. Are there any other common conditions that parents visit your office for? Probably one of the most common things that I see in the office are going to be viral infections. So colds, lots of sore throats, coughs. A lot of the time it's, it's a virus that's going to run its course, but there are certain things that um, parents can do to kind of ease the symptoms. A lot of times if there's fever, they can do Motrin and Tylenol. If they're congested, then they can suction out their baby's noses, humidifiers, certain things like that can help to ease the symptoms. And why did you want to become a pediatrician? I always knew that I wanted to be a doctor and then after um, doing my different rotations in medical school I really felt like pediatrics was kind of a really good fit for me and I like to watch the kids and patients that I see grow up through their different stages of life. So what is the most interesting things you've learned about kids? Kids bounce back really quickly. They'll come in feeling sick, they may need to get a shot, but you know, by the time they leave the office, a lot of times they're smiling. And so that's been really neat to see. Thank you, Dr. Sutton, for joining us tonight. There's so much to know when you're a new parent, and some of the things you've shared with us tonight will certainly ease their minds. Thank you for tuning in to TGMC To Your Health. I'm Rhonda Alford, and I'll see you right back here next week.
Hey guys, Patrick Labot here with Zach Bear, strength coaches at the Sports Performance Training Center. And today for our edition of the warm-up, we're going to be going over planks and how they correlate with push-ups. So there's two types of planks. Uh, one is the elbow plank, one is the hand plank. Today we're going to be demonstrating the elbow plank. First things first, you want the elbow to be on the ground directly underneath the shoulder. We're going to want the toes of our feet on the floor. We're going to want our hips off the ground. Biggest thing that you want to remember when you do it is that you want to squeeze the glutes and tighten down the abdominal muscles to make sure that the back stays flat. So one common mistake we see is uh, a sag in the hips, which causes pressure on the lower back. Uh, another common mistake we see is whenever the hips get too high. So for the push-up, we're going to have the same neutral spine braced position. Um, the only difference is going to be we're going to be lowering ourselves to the ground and back up from our hands. Uh, the hands we want to have just outside shoulder width in the comfortable position. Um, and the elbows want to make sure that they tuck to the side and don't flare out. That's good. If the elbows flare out, we're going to have a lot of pressure on the shoulder joint, which is just not a natural um, healthy position for the shoulder to be in. Now, if you can't hold the neutral spine brace position throughout the entire range of motion on your push-ups, the next step that you want to do is move down to the knees. We still want to have the same idea, tighten down the glutes, tighten down the abs, and keep that braced spine, but it's going to make it a little bit easier to go off the knees. Uh, if the knees is still a challenge for you, we can go to something more elevated like a table or a box. Thanks again for joining us, guys. Uh, we hope you learned something today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you for the next edition of The Warm-Up.